Hello, hello. Right now I'm in uh, Dibrugar. It's a little city in Assam. Pretty random place. I'm not really sure why I'm here. But uh, when I was Googling things to check out in the area, I found this temple here, this Juggernaut temple, which looks like a, kind of like a replica of the one that you see in Poon. Or no, not Poon, sorry, in Pori, in Juggernaut Pori. Wow, look at this. Is Krishna breastfeeding from a demon? I've never seen that before. If anyone knows that story, leave a comment below. But I thought it would be cool to come out to this temple, check it out. It looks, I drove past it yesterday when I was pulling in and uh, it looked beautiful. So I was like, oh, I have to go check it out. This here is Juggernaut. And Juggernaut is the he is the Lord of the Universe. I don't know much about him. That's his little face right there. You see him mostly at uh, Krishna temples. Oh shit. I just got a bunch of shit stuck in my hair. You usually see uh, Juggernaut depicted here at Krishna temples. Let's see uh, some of the stuff they have here that you can buy outside. Looks like some toys. Oh. oh. <laughs> How are you? Ram, 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 ram. We got this picture of a baby here. Picture of some cats. Yo, you guys wanna see a magic trick real quick before we go into the temple? Watch, I can make this ring jump fingers. You gotta watch quick, ready? Oh. Magic. Hello, G. Hello, G. <laughs> okay, let's go inside the temple and check it out. I've uh, been reading the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, these past few days and I feel really inspired Krishna 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 wow these are so cool I've never seen these before any depictions like this Ram Ram Ji Wow, cool Whoa, what is this? I've never seen something like this before It's like a Roman pillar But with these leaves, that's so cool I've never seen any art like this in India before Are you guys getting married? Yes. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> you guys look very nice. Can I see your henna? Wow, it's so pretty. When do you guys get married? Yesterday. Yesterday? Yesterday? Night. Wow. Are you excited? Yes. <laughs> cool. Congratulations, brother. It's very pretty. Yeah. I like your tattoos too. What do they say? It's, uh, is Ganesh? It's Ganesh or blessed me. Blessed me. Cool. 
I have Shiva here. Okay, bro. <laughs> cool. Good. Bye. See you. Nandi. Om Namah Shibai. I like some some different places in India. They change it up. Shibai. Rahar Mahade. Shiva, Shiva, Shiva. So this little thing here, this is called a Shiva Ling, a Shiva Lingam. And uh, it represents the male penis, I guess, is the, is the masculine form. Uh, yeah, divine. Oh, look at this little Hanuman or whatever, this little chubby Hanuman. Yeah, Hinduism is the coolest. Hello, Ram Ram Ji. <laughs> well, what a really cool temple complex. Just here in this random city, in Dibrugar. Wow, look at that elephant. Or demon elephant. Okay, let's go in this big temple. Let's see what's, what it looks like inside. So it looks like there's seven temples in this in this complex. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then this big one would be seven. Seven is a really interesting number that seems to have some kind of spiritual significance that I don't fully understand. But you see it reoccurring in so many of these spiritual traditions, like uh, even in Christianity, for example, like they said God made the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Or um, like the seven days even. We have seven days of the week. The Las Vegas. You know, you think, think about Vegas. Lucky number seven. There's seven skies in Egyptian mythology. Here in India, there are seven chakras. There's even a story of the Buddha taking seven steps at his birth. Also here in India... In the Hindu cosmology, there's seven different lokas or spiritual dimensions or worlds. Seven colors of the rainbow. The Bhagavad Gita is the book that probably brought me to India. I had a, an interesting kind of awakening and was introduced to this book when trying to sort of make sense of the kind of experience I was having. And it blew my mind how this book was explaining things that I was coming to the conclusion of. And uh, I was like, I need to go to India to figure out something because I feel like these people know something. And... Uh, I feel like it's still true, I still believe that. I still believe that Sanatana Dharma philosophy is probably the most poetic and full spiritual philosophy that humans have ever created. And I wanted to read some of these quotes from the Bhagavad Gita. Just uh, go over some of them and maybe we can talk about what it means. I just like Googled Bhagavad Gita quotes, so I didn't really look and see which ones we're going to get, so I'm just going to read them. And then maybe we can discuss and philosophize about what it means to us personally, or me personally. The key to happiness is reduction of desires. Like me dropping my phone. The key to happiness is the reduction of desires. You know, this, this seems uh, so contradictory because we go through life all the time saying like, oh man, if I just had this, I would be happy. Or if I could just get to where I want to be, I would be happy. 
we think items or people or success will bring us some sort of uh, some sort of happiness but we always feel like success will bring us happiness and then you hear people that are successful say like hey it's not true it's an illusion don't fall for it we all still fall for it of course because we have to learn that for ourselves you know no one can teach you about the self this is something you need to search for within no one who does good work will ever come to a bad end either here or in the world to come no one who does good work will ever come to a bad end either here or in the world to come man is made by his belief as he believes so he is similar to what the Buddha said and the Buddha would have been raised in a Vedic society he would have been raised with the knowledge in this book maybe even reading directly from the scripture Man is made by his belief, as he believes, so he is. This is the nature of ego, right? That we take on these identities and we cling to them and attach to them. And that's why we get offended. And that's why we get into wars and why we all, you know, live in like a Hollywood type of culture is because humans naturally are inclined to lose themselves in ego and what we believe and what we believe we are we are like we think we are I'm Dakota I go to India I do this I do that and I think this is who I am but really these are just stories that I cling to to represent this consciousness that is materialized temporarily as this in each moment I am losing the things I think I am. Ramana Maharshi used to say, let come what comes and let go what goes and find what remains. See the thing that doesn't change. See what is the essence of your being when you let all these things go. Like in India, they have a, a spiritual method of self-inquiry that they say neti neti, which means something like not this, not this. It's a practice of self-reduction to reduce the things that aren't you, to let it all go. You know, you think you can't live without your partner and then you guys break up and you feel like it's the end of the world and then you do live. So we know that these things are not us, even though we fully take them on as being who we are. Even our names. Each moment we are dying and we're losing who we are. Even Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, he says life is for that which is already dead because the enlightened being the enlightened soul the, the awakened consciousness realizes that there, there is it's, it's all one there is no ego but karma entangles us in this identity which forces us into birth which forces us into taking birth over and over and over again until we fulfill our desires until we fulfill our attachments and realize that these things are not who we actually are and I don't know if that's possible but they say that some being some some beings have like Ramana Maharshi or uh, Nisargata Maharaj or Neem Karoli Bhava or Prabhupada which these Krishna people sort of uh, relate to they say things like uh, it's all an illusion it's all an illusion nothing is happening be still, be quiet, go inward. The outside world is a temporary mirage, just like a dream. The self-controlled soul who moves amongst sense objects, free from either attachment or repulsion, wins eternal peace. That's like what we were just talking about. If you can move amongst the world, which in the Bhagavad Gita calls sense objects, objects, objects that are appear within the sensory apparatus of the human experience if you can move through the world without being attached to these things without being repulsed by these things simply just existing in a transcendent state beyond what you think is good or bad in relationship to your ego 
because good and bad is sort of a subjective concept, right? We all have our own ideas of what is, like you might not like something that I like or vice versa. Um, and we sort of uh, get lost in subjectivity. But this idea that you can meditate and get beyond your thoughts, you can get to a quiet space within yourself where the, where the thoughts fizzle away, yet you still exist, but you don't exist in relationship to these, these forms that are temporarily just like floating by, like clouds in your mind. Like if you really just watch your thoughts, like I was taking a shower earlier and I was thinking of such stupid things. Like my brain is filled with the most stupid stuff ever, filled with it. And I don't ever really pay attention to it. I just think it and then I go to the next thought and I think that and I just am in this loop. But there are moments where I get glimpses beyond that. So I know it's possible. And I know, I know it's possible. Those who eat too much or too little, who sleep too much or sleep too little, will not succeed in meditation. But those who are temperate in eating and sleeping Work and recreation will come to the end of sorrow through meditation. Again, this kind of goes back to some Buddhist principles of the middle way. You don't like the Buddha would starve himself, right? And he he lost all his followers when he when he decided to eat because they were like, "You told us, like you, you you gave us, you know, like don't be attached to the body. You're not the body." And then here you are, like indulging in indulging in the body. And uh, he came to the conclusion that the middle way is the best. It's not falling towards the extremes is not necessarily the way. Let's read that quote one more time. Those who eat too much or eat too little, sleep too much or sleep too little will not succeed in meditation. But those who are temperate in eating and sleeping, work and recreation will come to the end of sorrow through meditation. All pain exists inside of our head. You know, you see uh, people like Wim Hof who can control the temperature of his body with his brain. <laughs> he can go into freezing cold water and sustain it and sustain himself. What, when, where me or you would go into like a hypothermic shock or something, he can climb Mount Everest barefoot in shorts, shirtless. And he actually acknowledges that he learned these principles through yoga. The mind, we are actually in control of the mind, ultimately. But we don't know that, so it controls us. We allow it to control us. Happiness is a state of mind that has nothing to do with the external world. You came here empty-handed and you will leave empty-handed. What is yours today belonged to someone else yesterday, and it will belong to someone else tomorrow. So don't think too much. If you don't fight for what you want, don't cry for what you've lost. Yeah, you know, something interesting about the Bhagavad Gita is that it talks about, uh, about fighting and how like, uh, like for example, Arjuna tells Krishna, because he's about to go to war with his family because their kingdom is splitting up and they're all fighting over the kingdom. And Arjuna says, Krishna, like, I don't want to fight. What am I supposed to do? When I look out, I don't see enemies. I see friends, family, teachers, but they're forcing me to fight. And Krishna says something like, it doesn't matter. You're already dead. You're already, you already being chewed apart in my cosmic mouth. So fight and enjoy the earthly kingdom or die and be with me. There are two ways of passing from this world, one in the light and one in the dark. When one passes in light, he does not come back, but when one passes in darkness, he returns. He who has let go of hatred treats all beings with kindness and compassion, who is always serene and unmoved by pain or pleasure, free of the I and the mine, the mine, free of like, this is mine, free of clinging to things, Self-controlled, firm, and patient, his whole mind focused on me. That is the man I love best. Meaning like, to be a devotee of God is one of the most powerful 
things you can do. When you see God in everything, how can you be hateful or not compassionate? When you recognize that everybody is just another version of you and they are divine by their own mystery of awakening here in this world, they are divine by the illumination of their own eyes. When you realize this, how can you hate somebody else? Even if they slap you, Jesus said to turn the other cheek because they know not what they do. Pleasure from the senses seems like nectar at first, but it is a bitter poison in the end. Too much of anything is not good. You have the right to work, but never engage in action for the sake of rewards, nor should you long for inaction. This reminds me of a, an old Buddhist quote again, where they would say, before enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. Meaning, enlightenment isn't like levitating or spontaneously combusting into a spiritual dimension. Enlightenment is just that aha moment. Aha. Ah, yes, I remember. I remember I'm not my body. I remember that I am a part of something bigger than myself. Ah, I remember. And we all remember in, in some moments in life when we're looking at the stars or when we're staring at the ceiling in our room after a depressing day or a calm day or any time. You know, these moments hit us randomly, randomly in life. It is better to live your own destiny imperfectly than to live in imitation of somebody else's life with perfection. Oh man, our whole culture is like that, huh? Like we're all like uh, forced. That's what Terrence McKenna used to say, Cult culture is not your friend. It's because it indoctrinates us into ideologies and ideologies create egos, create Create a them, created us and them, and uh, the whole world is is stuck in this sort of thing. You know, this is why yoga is so important because it spirituality is is a revolutionary practice to reclaim the power within yourself and say like, I have the power. You know, and this is why Gandhi, why Gandhiji's revolution of ahimsa was uh, was so powerful and. I acknowledge Bhagat Singh did a, uh, a beautiful part in that revolution too, you know, Jay Bhagat Singh, but yeah, Gandhiji uh, is, a good, is a good representation of that quote, because uh, despite the British imposing themselves on India, Gandhi led a peaceful revolution. The brightness of the sun which lights up the whole world. The brightness of the moon and a the fire, these are my glory. As you put on fresh clothes, take off those you've worn. In the same way, you'll replace your body with a fresh one, newly born. The soul is immortal. I do believe, actually, that there is a part of us that is playing out the desires of our past lives, of our past incarnations. I think consciousness crystallizes and takes form into a drama, into a theater of materialism as a way to wake up. I think this whole drama, this whole theater of life is intentional and we agreed on it because this is the only way that we can wake up. And it might take us lifetimes. Some of us might get it this lifetime. Some of us might not get it for billions of lifetimes. We might have already lived billions of lifetimes. You know, I think of instincts as being echoes from previous incarnations. Like you think of, why, why are you afraid of the dark? You're afraid of the dark because our ancestors are screaming to us from the past that we need to be afraid of the dark because when they were alive, it was a threat, you know, there was things hiding under the bed, monsters, tigers, snakes, and all of these things that could kill us. So these useful, these useful uh, experiences 
have been passed down through our genetics by our previous incarnations. And so much of our life is like that, you know. What is an instinct? The gift is pure when it is given from the heart to the right person at the right time, the right place, and when we expect nothing in return. This book was written like 4,000 years ago or something. Maybe, maybe even longer. Reshape yourself through the power of will. Never let yourself be degraded by self-will. The will is the only friend of the self, and the will is the only enemy of the self. That's interesting, because I am under the impression that free will doesn't exist. That's 25 quotes from the Bhagavad Gita. <sighs> Some of the most poetic spirituality ever. And I'm happy to share it with you guys. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And comment your favorite Bhagavad Gita quotes if you have any. Let's check out this temple one more time. I think there's a couple places we didn't check out yet. Man, that pillar's still tripping me out. I love how it's like a lotus opening and the leaves are falling down like that. So cool. Oh, Hanuman. We didn't see the Hanuman temple yet. Let's go over here. Oh no, she just littered right at the temple. Oh, wow, look at that. That's cool. Look at this. Ram 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 Ram. <laughs> Hello G. Kese? Tike? Look at this horse playing guitar. It's like a metal band. Hanuman. Namaskar. Hello, hello. Shiva, Shiva, Shiva. Okay, let's go check out this Hanuman over here. You know, it's interesting. Hanuman is actually Shiva. There's a story of Ram being such a pure devotee of Mahadev that Shiva feels so humbled by this devotion that he comes in the form of Hanuman Ji, Hanuman Baba, to worship Ram. And Jay Hanuman. And Hanuman is so cool. I love Hanuman because Hanuman in Sanskrit, Hanu means something like, like clenching of strong jaws. I've read it, I've read it interpreted as being like to annihilate with force. And Man means mind. And Hanuman is the is like uh, he represents the control the, the control of the mind, the annihilation of the ego, and uh, he actually is ripping his chest open, and inside of his heart is Ram, is God, and uh, Baba Ramdas. Baba Ramdas used to always tell the story of Hanuman that I love. When Ram asked Hanuman, he said, Hanuman, what are you? Are you a monkey or are you a man? Like, what is your true nature? And Hanuman responded, Gee, when I don't know who I am, I serve you. And when I know who I am, I am you. And I always love that story. And here's Ram right here, Jay Shri Ram. Yeah. Ram Ram Ji. Ram Ram. I'm from America. America. Yeah. America. Where are you from? I'm from Assam. You're from Assam? Yes. Cool. Nice to meet you. Thanks. <laughs> this is Ram and Lakshman. Who's this one here? 
Which one? This one on the side here. The Sita? Yeah. Yes, yes. It's Sita, Sita. Ram, and Lakshman? Yes. And who's this one here at the bottom of the right? Yeah, this uh, one at the bottom. I think it's uh, Hanumanji. This is Hanumanji uh, this here. Is Hanumanji. This one. It's like the bird. Bali. <laughs> Bali. 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 Bali, huh? Bali. Bali is uh, is big in Assam. I see it everywhere in Assam. This this murti. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's okay. Okay. I don't know who this bird deity is, but I see it all over here in Assam. Not only in Assam, but specifically it's all over here. Oh, here's Lakshmi. Jai Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. Jai Lakshmi Devi. Hello. Hello. It's been so long since I've been to a temple. It feels so, so relieving to just uh, get to chill at a temple for a little bit. It's been probably since before the pandemic. All right, well, this was the Jagannath temple of Vibhugar. Hello, Ji, Ram Ram. Don't the women dress so pretty? If you're ever in randomly in Debrugar for whatever reason, you gotta come here. I didn't film it, but like I had a swarm of Indians just like taking pictures of me. Being a, a foreigner in India makes you feel famous. Oh, look at this little juggernaut right here. This is cool. Carved right into the wall. Check this out. I'm not sure the differences between which is which. I think this one here is Jagannath, which I think means the Lord of the Universe. I'm not too familiar with these. I think this is more South Indian, even though we're in the Northeast. I think you find these mostly in like Jagannath Puri or Mayapur. We are close to West Bengal, so it does make sense. And here's a Shiva Ling, again up close. You can kind of get, it's got, uh, they pour milk on it. Oh, and it has a Datura flower on it. Look, this is a Datura flower, which is, uh, well, all over the world, shamans use it to have visions. And there's a story in the Shiva Purana where a Datura flower grows out of his chest. Actually, I have a Datura flower tattooed here on my arm for that reason. I don't know if you can see it. It's above my Shiva. I have a Shiva tattoo and then there's Datura flower. And it's because of, of that. And I've never personally smoked Datura or drank it in a tea, but uh, yeah, for the shamans that know how to properly use it, it is a very intense visionary experience. And I think that's probably where it stems from. Okay, G, goodbye. Goodbye. And some of the people that took pictures with me. Did you know that Lord Shiva listened to high tech?